Hey guys, Michael Corsentino with my March 2017 lighting tutorial for Shutter Magazine. Do yourself a favor and pick up the print edition of Shutter Magazine, which you can find at Barnes & Noble if you want even more great photography education content. Uh, you can also head over to the BehindTheShutter.com website and subscribe so you never miss an issue and you also have all that content available to you on all of your digital devices, iPads, laptops, etc. So this month we are talking all about lighting on location. All right. Uh, I want to walk you through a recent fashion editorial shoot that I did for a boutique here in Orlando, Florida with an amazing creative team on board, uh, which as you guys know, if you've watched any of my previous videos, I am a big advocate of uh, working within a team, uh, which is kind of the de facto way of working when you're doing fashion and editorial work um, and portrait work as well. Uh, you typically have a whole team and you know, as a result, your images are always better than if you just try and do everything yourself. All right, so let's dig right in. We're starting off with a couple uh, peeks at some of the finals. Um, here's a crop of one of the finals. Here are a couple others. So you can see here there's a sort of a consistent look to the light. Uh, now when you're working on location and specifically out of doors, there are considerations that are very different than when you're working on location and let's say, you know, inside. Uh, you know, you never really know what Mother Nature is going to throw at you. Despite whatever the weather forecasts are, uh, things can really change very quickly uh, once you're there as well. So even if it's calling for a sunny day, uh, you know, you don't want to, on the day of it can be overcast or you can get there and it can be very sunny when you're starting out and then all of a sudden, you know, it can change to very overcast and back and forth and back and forth. So when I am planning a shoot like this, I'm always building in a lot of options and redundancy. Uh, I want to make sure that no matter what happens with the lighting conditions, um, uh, you know, an ambient light in the situation is your dominant light source, and basically we're filling with strobe. Uh, I always want to make sure that I have, you know, all my bases covered so that if it's really bright out, I have mechanisms to deal with that uh, because typically when it's really bright and the sun is really harsh, that's not the ideal kind of lighting that I want. I want something much softer. You'll see this is a very soft looking shoot. Um, and I needed to bring certain tools and techniques to bear in order to create that look. So we're going to talk about all of that. Um, and I needed to be able to deal with, again, if it's very harsh sunlight, how do I deal with that? And if it's also uh, overcast and there is no sun and the sun is behind clouds, how do I deal with that? How do I create uh, the kind of lighting that I want based on that as well? All right, so let's dig in and start off with the overall looks that we had for this. Here are the four looks that we um, that we planned on doing or that we were going to attempt to do. Uh, this was a little bit... Um, uh, overly optimistic uh, on our parts, but you know we were we were very um, uh, we planned to do a lot, but we you know we we always plan to do more than we more than we sometimes can. So basically, we got these looks done, and this one didn't make it. So we photographed this piece and this and these pieces here. Um, so not a bad day. I mean, we started at noon and set up, and we wrapped at sunset. So we still got quite a bit accomplished. Um, all right, so let's. So that was the first thing, is you know, you share the. As you, you guys have looked at some of my previous videos, you know that one of the first things, and I don't have the mood boards in here, but you share uh, mood boards with your team. You make sure that everyone's on the same page creative team, creative director, stylist, wardrobe, all the rest of it. Um, and uh, that's how, you know, th those were the looks that we came up with from the boutique. Okay. So one of the first things that I know that I need when I'm dealing with, you know, shooting outside and trying to tame sunlight is a scrim. That is one of my go-to tools. And you can see that here. This is the scrim that I was using. Uh, I was using an 8x8 California sun bounce scrim. And you can see here what that does, if we've got the sun coming from here, is it takes the light from this to this. It gives us this beautiful shade. So that's a really, really essential tool uh, when you're dealing with 
bright sunlight, when you want to knock that sunlight down and give yourself some nice even shade. And then from there, you can bring in fill light and you can bring in accent lights and all the rest of it, which we'll go over. Um, so some of the things that you're going to need in order to get this kind of thing happening is you're going to need sandbags, which you can see here and here at the bottom of the light stands. And I had some C stands in order to go with these are Coupo Grip um, Master C stands, the 40 inch version. Uh, and then these specialized grip heads. These are California Sunbounce Enterprise grip heads is what they're called. And those are used here and here. All right. Uh, now you can find really uh, pop-up versions of these diffusion panels, you know, something that's more, much more lightweight and portable and something that a, uh, an assistant can hold or that you can mount on a light stand. Um, you know, in, in that case, you're going to be kind of limited to three quarter and head and shoulders shots. So that's why I always opt for the largest one that I can possibly manage because it just gives me more flexibility, allows me to shoot full figure um, and couples and you know groups and that sort of thing. And obviously, the, the, the more people you have, the bigger uh, diffusion uh, the scrim that you're going to need, right? Uh, okay, so that's the first piece, is having a way to diffuse and control harsh sunlight. And that will always be uh, a scrim, otherwise known as a diffusion panel, all right? Okay, so let's talk about the lighting. So I wanted a couple different setups and a couple different ways to approach the light. Some that were more stationary and some that were more flexible. So the first plan was to um, create a very soft light, a very broad light source uh, for one of the setups because I wanted to give myself a, like, about five different options. And we'll walk through the lighting diagrams uh, and you'll see exactly what my thought process was and which ones we used and which ones we didn't have to. Um, okay, so first thing is the key light. So we started off with a 74 inch Ellen Chrome Octabank and that was powered with a Profoto 1200 watt second 7B pack. Uh, and I just, this is backwards, but this is the Ellen Chrome 74 inch octa. I wanted to orient, orient it in the same way that it was being fired at our models, which was this way, as you'll see. Uh, and I triggered this pack with a Pocket Wizard plus three, uh, and I used a Sakonic L758 DR light meter in order to take the light readings. And that, what's cool about this is it allows me to trigger this. Right, so I can audit when I you know, hit this button here to take the reading. Um, it automatically fires the strobe, so it's all wireless, which is what I'm trying to say, uh, which is uh, the great a great way to meter. I don't, you know, I'd rather not have all sorts of PC cords and stuff hanging around, and they, they're prone to break, um, and people can trip over them and all the rest of it. So. A part of this rig also included a C stand, another C stand. That's, this is an, again a, a Coupo Master a C stand, 40 inch riser. Um, and on top of that is a 2.5 inch grip head with a baby pin. Now, why am I including all this? Uh, well, because when you're shooting on location, I've talked about this in the past, it's really important to be buttoned up about the gear list that you're going to be bringing. Because if you forget one thing, like if I forgot this one piece here, uh, I would have been out of luck when it came to attaching my strobe uh, to, you know, so that's really important, you know, so I pre-flight everything. I set all this up beforehand uh, and I make sure that I have every little piece that I need because it only takes one little thing for you to be out of luck when you're on location. All right, so I also brought a Profoto um, B1 battery operated head. You can see here both of these are battery operated, so that's going to be really key when you're working on location and you don't have to worry about generators and power. So I always opt for battery power when I can. Um, and that, of course, necessitated a second light stand. So this is two. So two for the scrim uh, and two for the strobes, right? Uh, also, a seven inch reflector that was meant to go on this B1. Uh, and the plan was to use uh, CTO gels. That's what these are, okay? Those are color temperature orange gels. And they come, you can see, in various densities from quarter to half to full, okay? Uh, and those are going to give you warmer and warmer color tones. And I use those to rep replicate the warmth of the sun. When the, when the, uh, when the sun becomes, uh, when the sun goes away and it goes behind clouds and it becomes very overcast, uh, you lose all that and it becomes a very cool tone. Uh, you know, in the net, the ambient light becomes very cool. So in order to bring back the warmth of the sun and to replicate what that would look like, I gel this reflector with one of these 
pieces of gel, right? Depending on how much uh, warmth I want will dictate which one of these I use, okay? So, uh, and typically I'm using that as an accent light or a rim light or a hair light, okay? Uh, and you can, of course, use this on, uh, you know, a strip box if you wanted, you know, more light. I just brought this to use. I also had some strip boxes with me, but uh, that was the plan. Uh, okay, so that was the key light setup. And that was, again, for the more stationary light setup that I was going to do. So anywhere from one to two lights and the scrim was going to be my starting point. Okay. All right, so the second light setup that I wanted was something that was more mobile, something that would allow me to move around from place to place and really work very quickly. Uh, and for that, um, I love this setup. You've seen this on a couple other shoots recently, uh, and that is the Quadra uh, Ranger, and that's the 400 watt second head here. You can see here that it is really tiny and really lightweight. It is a pack and head system, so you'll have to have your assistant uh, or you yourself uh, wearing this on a shoulder pack. Uh, it comes with a little strap that you can use. Um, and it's just, I, I, you can't beat it when it comes to lightweight, uh, you know, and quick, working quickly. It's, I, I, the whole thing is um, set up on a pole here, this extension pole, shoreline extension pole, using this KC adapter, uh, KC 5 8 pole adapter that you can pick up over there at KC's website. Uh, you can see here that it screws onto the, this bit here. Uh, and it allows you to mount your light head there onto it right there. Okay. Um, and modifying the light is an Ellen Chrome 27.5 Rotolux Deep Octa. This thing rocks. Again, I've used this uh, on a bunch of shoots recently. This is kind of my go-to uh, location rig when I want to be really mobile and really move around quickly and be able to move my subjects from one place to another fast. It works great for fashion. It works great for portrait. It's just a killer little setup. Um, and uh, for that, I used a, sp a light meter that is specific to triggering wirelessly for, for Ellen Chrome, and that is, you can see that here, that's the Sekonic L7, uh, L478 um, Light Master. Yeah, it's the mouthful, but that's, that's what I used to trigger this to take my meter readings. Uh, and I also brought with me a California Sun Bounce uh, Sun Swatter Pro. I think this is the large one, but I think I brought the Pro with me. Um, and I used that just in case I would have needed to, uh, again, to diffuse light. So we had a more stationary diffuser, which kind of is best situated, you know, on uh, C-stands. And then I also brought this so that I could diffuse the light if I needed to. Ended up not really needing this uh, because by the time we were using this, it was sunset, as you'll see. So the light was just perfect and didn't need to be diffused. We were able to use it as a kicker light in that case, as you will see. All right, so also um, in the kit bag, was a large, I think this was also an 8x8, eight eight diffu um, not diffusion, a black block panel. You can see here that this is solid black, so if I wanted to introduce uh, additional shadow, I would use this. I always have one of these in one particular size or another with me, either in the studio or on location, because you, you can't uh, underestimate uh, how great it is to introduce shadow sometimes. Sometimes you want to take away shadow, when you, uh, which is when you're going to use reflectors like these, which I also had a bunch of different reflectors with me, California Sun Bounce Pro and Mini and Micro Mini, and this strip, a couple strips as well, just so that you really, again, have lots of options, okay, because you never know what Mother Nature is going to give you to work with, or what you're going to see in the back of your camera. You know, you may see, you know, you may have planned for one thing, and then you know, uh, you look at the back of the camera, or you look at your uh, laptop, or you look at your iPad if you're tethering, and you realize, well, you know what, I really would rather go a different direction, or I could. this could benefit from X, Y, and Z, and if you don't have the tools with you, then you really, you can't do those things. So I pack heavy, I always uh, have, you know, lots of options, and, uh, you know, for better or worse, that's the way I work. Okay. Uh, next up, a couple of uh, odds and ends that are super important. Uh, it's funny, but sometimes it's the least expensive things and the things uh, that um, make the biggest difference. So gaff tape, always have gaff tape, a uh, little fold-up ladder, uh, just hugely indispensable piece of gear, and apple boxes. I bring a couple apple boxes with me on every shoot. Uh, I use them for all sorts of things, but they're great even just to sit on um, when you're shooting. If you are, if you want to sit low and you don't want to be on the ground, or you just don't want to, um, you know, tweak your knees, th this really helps. Apple boxes are great. 
uh, and they're pretty inexpensive. Okay, so before we dig into everything else, uh, lastly, I shot this all uh, with my medium format system. I use phase one uh, 645DF plus. I haven't upgraded yet. I'm a slacker to the new I the new uh, body, but eventually that will happen. And the IQ250 back, which is here. Um, and I brought a tripod with me. I use the Gitzo um, carbon fiber series. I think it's called the Mountaineer series. Um, and I didn't end up using it. Um, sometimes I do, sometimes I don't. In this case, I didn't. I handheld. Um, and when I am using this, uh, I don't know if you guys have struggled with finding a good um, uh, head. You know, this Manfrotto tilt pan three-way head is just the bee's knees. I've got to say, like, I've tried a whole bunch of different tilt pan heads, and they're all really frustrating for me. Uh, and this thing is just killer. It works like nobody's business. Uh, and you will need a little adapter plate there between there and there uh, to make that happen. But you, it's also a Manfrotto thing. Okay, so let's take a look at some behind the scenes photos. Uh, here you can see uh, we're getting ready for the shoot. That is our creative director and awesome uh, hair and makeup artist, Audra. Um, and then Milton, we had a bunch of different people. Again, lots of, we had a great team on this shoot, about eight different people helping to, you know, carry it off and make it a success. Uh, here you can see some of the, some of the equipment. Now, I didn't mention this uh, in the equipment list, but I also, I did bring a Profoto Deep Umbrella. I think it was in white and one in silver. Uh, again, just more options in case stuff isn't working, in case the you know softbox is blowing over and it's just it's too big or it's just not happening. Uh, you, that's another important note is you know with sandbags and with large modifiers, that's why you want to have people there because you know these kinds of modifiers when you're working on location, they can quickly become a sale. That you know the wind kicks up and these things can tip over. Uh, they can go flying, that, you know, that your, your talent can be in danger, your gear can be in danger. So you always want to sandbag, you know, I double sandbag in some instances, and I always like to have extra people on hand just to mind those light modifiers, to hang on to them in case the wind kicks up. And we did have that happen on this shoot, so worth mentioning. Okay, so extra gear and just, you know, being mindful that, you know, when you're on location, wind can definitely be an issue. All right, and here you see some more shots of our location. Uh, and there is MC, our awesome stylist. She brought these great chairs. I have to ask her where she got these, these fold-up chairs. Just, you know, really small thing. But, man, I'll tell you, they go a long way when you're working on location. Having a place to sit uh, when you're between shots and, you, you know, things like this are happening. The makeup artist is working. And, you know, it's just unbelievably valuable little piece of kit. Uh, here you can see behind Audra, uh, I'm setting up the scrim. We've got our... Octabank is set up there, uh, and here we're getting it into position, so you can get a sense of the size. This was an 8x8 sun, sun scrim, made by California Sun Bounce, and there you can see it in position on the uh, C-stands. You can see the other smaller portable scrim that we had, and a bunch of light modifiers laying around on the ground. Um, as things are starting to get set up. Okay, so the first lighting diagram, and this is where we first started out uh, to create this particular softer quality of light. All right, so let's take a look at this, what exactly I'm doing here. All right, so we've got the sun coming from this side, right? But I didn't want that brightness here. I wanted to soften it. So that's why I've employed the scrim. You can see that here. So that really gives us this soft quality of light on this side of the face. And you're gonna see I changed that, that up as we move through to the next setup by removing the scrim, and then you're gonna see what a huge difference it makes, okay? Now, on the other side, I've got that seven, 74 inch Ellen Chrome uh, Indirect Octa, and that is placed right here, and you can see the way it's oriented. Sorry, my lines are not straight. Uh, but you get the sense that we're working, uh, you know, in a very defined way. Um, I've got the, the, the softbox is not at an angle, okay? I've got it at a very hard angle, a right angle to the subjects, and that's going to create this really nice wrap across subjects, all right? Um, and I'm also feathering the light, right? So by placing the softbox just in front, nearly in front. There's a little bit, it's you know, almost in front, right? 
uh, of the subjects, and the subject is almost behind the softbox, you can see here that what happens is I'm working with the edge of the light, and that really gives this really soft quality of light that you can see here, right? And it just kind of rakes the light across both of the subjects, which is really nice. Uh, and same thing here, like I don't have really, really bright areas here and here, which can happen a lot. Um, uh, if you're, and I'm also not angling the light uh, top to bottom, I'm not angling it, pitching it downward. It's just at a very, very straight uh, orientation to the subjects, um, top to bottom and, you know, side to side. Okay, so that was our first setup, and you can see, you can see here the results that it yields, okay? So really simple, just one light and a scrim. Uh, we're diffusing the light with the scrim, and we're filling in using the octa, right? So we're just using fill light. All right, because when you're, when you're doing ambient and flash, it's, it's basically, it's all about balancing those two light sources, and you're doing that independently. And I talk about that a little bit more uh, in the article, okay? Uh, and here's a behind-the-scenes shot just to give you an idea of exactly where that octabank was placed in relationship to our subjects. And that you know, I'll, I would tweak that a little bit as I go, as needed. And there I am laying down on the job. See that? Good help is hard to find. Uh, okay, so next up is uh, our second look. And basically what I did here is everything's basically the same except all I did was remove the scrim. Okay, so you can see here that the scrim was here before, now it's gone. All right, so let's just take that line out. Uh, everything is exactly the same, but you can see the result. Now, all of a sudden, I've got this really gorgeous edge light happening here and here. It really changes the look. It's not necessarily a better look, but it's definitely a different look. It gives it that more dimensional quality that I've talked about in previous videos where you're adding that second light. Essentially what we're creating is cross light here, right? Between our ambient light, between the sun and our strobe, right? And that's creating that cross light pattern uh, and that is giving us that light here and light here. And I'm using a very soft light from this light um, and a, a more edgy, harder light here. So you definitely can con combine hard and soft light uh, and get some really nice effects, okay? Now you could also, if I wanted to, if this was, if I was dealing with an overcast situation, uh, I could use a, um, a strobe to create this kind of look gelled. And I, we talked about that in the gear, uh, and we're gonna talk about that, I think, in, in a couple upcoming slides. So that would be, right, exactly, that would be here. So here's a slide of what that would look like. So what I would do is, if I was overcast, or if I didn't like that bright sunlight look, and I wanted to try and get something a little bit softer, I still wanted that kicker light, I still wanted that edge light happening here, I would just use a strobe, and I would either do that with the uh, scrim or without, depending on lighting conditions. If it was really bright out, uh, and I wanted to cut the bright light, I would use the scrim, and if it was not, and it was just overcast, then I wouldn't really need the scrim, but I would still use the strobe. Strobe. The strobe would be gelled with that CTO gel in anywhere from quarter to half to full uh, CTO to full density, and that is going to give me a nice warm orange glow right along there to replicate what the, the warmth of the sun. And so sometimes you, you may need that, and that's why I had that with me, okay? So everything else has remained constant. All right, here is... Uh, what it would look like. We did it, we did a couple shoots, but I really like the way that the uh, the natural sun, we had enough natural sun coming in and out. In this particular instance, we lost it, it went behind the clouds. So here you can see uh, that strobe, that secondary strobe in the back with the CTO gel on there, and that was meant to give some orange glow around here. We only used it in a couple shots and then I didn't really need it. Okay, so moving on. All right, so I said in the article, and I'll, it bears repeating here, that, um, you know, it's just as important as it is to know when to turn on your strobe. It's as important to know when to turn it off. You, you basically, you can't beat Mother Nature. Mother Nature, the sun it can be absolutely beautiful. But if you, and, and if you know how to work with it, you can get just gorgeous, gorgeous results. So here I'm creating a really, really soft, beautiful look by simply just turning off my strobes and using the sun and a scrim. So the scrim is taking the sunlight, which was kind of harsh. You saw what it looked like in the other image where we'd used it undiffused, where we created that hair light with that in the previous uh, image. Let's see if we can jump back to that for a minute. 
there, right? You can see how harsh that is right there. So, okay. So you can see how soft it is just by adding this scrim. I've completely softened it. What I've done is I've taken that harsh light and I've broadened it. I've created this really wide softbox, essentially, and created this really beautiful, soft quality of light that we have all raking across our model. How beautiful is that, right? Okay. So that's the kind of effect that you can get just using natural light. And again, you could do this with a soft, with a small diffusion panel, create this soft look. But, you know, I want to shoot full figure. I want to have the option to shoot full figure. Uh, I want to have the biggest source that I can because the bigger the source, the softer the light, right? All right, so here's a behind the scenes just to show you what that looks like. And you can see just how bright that panel is. And you really can't get a sense of it because of the exposure here, but she's, you know, getting really nicely lit by that. Okay. So now again, when the light changes and you don't have the sun giving you that light on that scrim, you can still get this effect by popping in a strobe. So here again, I'm using a, a strobe just to light up that diffusion panel right? That scrim. So this is the effect that you can create. So you can see it's pretty similar to what you can get with the sun. If you know how to work it. And it's really easy. I mean, you're just, you know, lighting up that scrim with a strobe. And you could also throw a CTO gel in there if you want to get a little warmth as well. But there you go. There's the look that you can create. So really simple techniques. And you can use this the same technique again with smaller scrims and smaller diffusion panels. But the bigger the panel, the, the softer the look. All right, let's keep moving. There are a couple behind the scenes shots as well. So you can see what that looks like in terms of the proximity placement between the subject and the scrim. And what's next? Next is our last shoot of the day. Okay, so this was when we switched into our mobile lighting setup. Let's go back to that setup for a minute and show that to you. That is going to be this one. Okay, so that's when we switched over to the light to the light on a stick. And that's what we've got going on here. So again, super simple. You've seen this setup before. Uh, here I'm using it uh, with ambient and flash together. So we've got our sun here, setting sun, giving us this really nice edge light here. See how gorgeous that is. Uh, we didn't need to use diffusion on this because the sun was uh, positioned low in the sky, giving us this really gorgeous amber quality of light. Um, and and we're using our key light here is that 27.5 Ellen Chrome Octabank. Uh, it's really small portable Octabank on a 400 watt second Ellen Chrome Quadra head, uh, all on a stick. Uh, it's really super portable situation. And I believe that I, and that's again, just giving us this really soft light here and here. Uh, I believe that I've got a behind the scenes shots. Yep. There we go. So you can see exactly what that looks like. It's really a, a great way to work. So one quick note about exposure. So basically when you're doing this kind of shooting and you, and I'm working in manual cause that's my preferred method. Um, the distance between your subjects and your light source is something that you need to be cognizant of, okay? So I always tell the people who are holding that light, in this case, Milton, you wanna maintain the same distance. Like once we get the exposure dialed in, you want to maintain the distance between the light and the subject. And that way you are free to move wherever you want. As long as that distance remains constant, your exposure is going to be rock solid and you're going to be in, in good shape, right? So you can see here that the light that we're getting from the sun without any flash. I mean, it's just beautiful, that light that you're getting. So I'm always looking for what kind of light the sun can give me and how I can use it in my shots. And I, I use this backlight technique all the time. It works like a charm. All right, so let's take a look at the overall shots. And you can see here that even using these different methods, right, I, what I, my goal was to create a consistent look for the lighting. And you can see here that they hang together really well as a consistent look for all the images for this editorial. All right. So that's all of the images. There are other great images, but these are the ones that I selected to, uh, to edit and to work on. Uh, all my editing was done in Capture One Pro 10 uh, and Photoshop. Uh, and you guys, these are color graded. I did a little color grading in Capture One. And the retouching was done um, in Photoshop. 
All right, and here's our group shot. You got to do a group shot at the end. It's a tradition. Uh, and the credit slide. I couldn't do what I do without my awesome creative team. So big props to them for an amazing work on this shoot and all the shoots that we do together. Uh, so that's going to wrap it up for this month. I hope you guys enjoyed this as much as I did. And I will see you next month here at Behind the Shutter.